watched it, so you don't have to. And I stole that line from Nostalgia Critic. Sorry. Hi friends! Hi! My name is Mia and this is My Virtual Vanity, a place where we both love makeup and we're quite critical of it. And I watched the second and third parts of The Beautiful World of Jeffree Star, so you don't have to. My notes over here because I am still in the 17th century and like to write everything by hand. The white balance keeps going off in the footage. And my head looks like a potato. Bear with me while I figure things out with this new filming setup. Without further ado, let's talk about my summary and review slash impressions of the part two and three of the Jeffree Star series. I'm gonna link part one of that above, or if I can't figure out how to do that, it's going to be down below in the circle of hell that is the description box. I think this episode was really eventful because we got to see a lot of the ins and outs on, of the beauty industry. Friendship is a hell of a drug, and when you try to win the approval of a friend that you find is much better than you because you've got shitty self-esteem, you will literally do everything. What I can tell from his self-deprecating humor, Shane has been in this industry for years and still does not think that he has the value that he objectively has as a creator and as a YouTuber. There's a huge element of imposter syndrome, which I can honestly really relate to, so I feel for him. And there is endless comparison with other people and his peers. I'm not 100% sure if this is genuine or if this is calculated humbleness. But I do feel at a certain point that this is at least halfway through genuine. Also because I suffer from major imposter syndrome and shitty self-esteem, so I know that no matter how well you do in life, those things stay with you unless you get your ass to a therapist. Then they go to meet Jeffrey himself. Get to Jeffrey's warehouses and studio. These are new fixtures in his business. The studio is unfinished, the warehouse is new, and he plans on expanding. So it's clear that his business is booming and no matter how many times we cancel him or throw a hashtag Jeffrey is over party, he is still flourishing and making money. But I do think that we are about a drop in the ocean and that we are not affecting his end revenue much. Fuck it, I'll still call it as it is when he does some crap, so. In this space, we also see that he commercializes a lot of merch, which confirms the speculations that Jeffrey is so rich in part because he expanded beyond his beauty line and also want to have business and professional relationships with a lot of other influencers through his merch line. He confirmed that he did James Charles's apparel line. He mentions that he sells millions of pieces of J James's line and that um, he's happy to help, which mm, <laughs> that comment did not age well. He mentions something really important at a certain point and that the old series has had a good impact on his business. Now, don't get me wrong, this whole series is a big PR marketing move. It's the best thing Jeffrey could have done for his public image. To have someone that is generally well liked to present him in, in a human and likable manner. Now, is Jeffrey Star just a plague upon humanity in certain ways? Yes. Does he have his good sides? Yes. But Shane came out with his first series and suddenly because Jeffrey seemed likable in those areas, people were really quick to forgive and forget even if it, there, it wasn't their place to forgive and forget, such as white women saying they forgive him for using racial slurs. It ain't our place. It really is not. I don't deny Jeffrey may be a good human being in certain aspects, but, but you can't forget all of the evil shit he's done just because Shane made him more humane in his first part and is doing so again in this second one. As I said, this is calculated, this is made to just give Jeffrey a redeem arc and they're succeeding, they're succeeding. They really are. The beauty collective is really quick to be fickle about their opinions about people 
Um, lots of people are fake woke and they just go with the wind. They like this person today, they don't like this person today. So there is that. Yeah, no wonder this series is helping Jeffrey with his business and selling more makeup. They then start talking true business. And that is, how fast does the palette come to market? How much money do they make? What's the markup? Important facts to keep in mind from this series are the following. A palette or new product may take six to seven months at least to start creating and producing. Quality stuff takes time to produce and think of. Constant releases must have some cut over someplace. Either in the production stuff, which may or may not be a good thing, it may be because those people perfected producing things at a fast rate, or because those people skipped on quality. Another thing to keep in mind is the crazy markup companies put on, which should be a logical thing. We are essentially paying premium price for sparkle dust. I've always said that. Am I a clown for paying premium price for sparkle dust that I don't need? Maybe, but life is short. I'm going to take what fleeting pleasures I can from it. So the thing is most makeup doesn't deserve its price. There are crazy markups of up to 200, 300, 500 percent of the production price. The less customized the packaging is, the higher the markup is. Jeffrey mentions that his profit is not that great from his markup because he keeps his prices relatively low to the standard markup that makeup companies apply. His product should be much more expensive, per his words, because he does a lot of custom components, his packaging is unique every single time, which true props, where props are due, and he also has custom designs, which all add up to the production cost. For him, it takes $20, $25 to produce a palette, he sells them at $40, uh, $50 mark, something like that, I'm not sure. Whereas he could sell them as per the markup of the other brands who produce palettes at six to ten dollar mark and sell them at 25, 30 mark, he could be asking for much more money, three times more money than the production cost. In fact, does make sense that we are paying a premium for branding, name, packaging, customization, and not necessarily for the formula itself. Also, he gave hard numbers, just so you can imagine how rich this man is. On a palette, he mentioned that he made 20 million dollar profits on one palette, and he has multiple palettes in his collection and multiple lines. At this point, he literally wipes his ass with one dollar bills. They start then talking about the creative process itself. And uh, Jeffrey mentions his process, which I find very admirable and very intriguing. He says that he tries to make each collection a moment in time, an artwork in a sense. And I really resonated to that as an artist myself. Sometimes I want to draw things to just pluck something out of my head and make it be static. I want to envision one moment, one thought, one vision, one aesthetic into a particular piece. So he takes the same approach with his makeup. He tries to give stories, moods, aesthetics, which honestly I find admirable coming from a brand owner, mostly considering the slew of shitty, poorly thought out releases that people have been coming with in 2018, 2019, and will probably continue to do so in 2020. He asked Shay to bring some makeup that he likes to start brainstorming on his palette. And incidentally, Shane brought some Too Faced. Point in which Jeffrey mentions that he really dislikes Too Faced. Now, I think this was scripted. Way too big of a distance not to be scripted, but whatever. He spills some hot tea and he says that he dislikes Too Faced because of the owner who has been rude to him, but also because they fucked over Nikki tutorials, which was a thing speculated on and stale a tea, but nothing truly 100% confirmed. So he mentioned that Nikki should have made millions from her palette, but she signed a fixed sum contract for $45,000 or $50,000, something like that, which was 0.005% of the profits. 
So she really got screwed over by them and Jeffrey points out that a lot of brands don't care about their influencers they're collaborating with, they're only caring about the end margin of things. He mentions that for this collaboration that he does with Shane, Shane should get 70%. Shane is astounded at this because he initially thought when Jeffrey mentioned, oh, we're looking at a ballpark of a 70% margin, he thought that Jeffrey was referring to himself and Jeffrey Star Cosmetics, not to Shane. So then they start this discussion about what is fair to give to influencers. And Jeffrey Star mentions that most companies profit from influencers' naivety and from legal loopholes to not pay their influencers correctly. Such lack of transparency in this industry about how much people make, how much people are paid, how much profit is from the palettes, how much markup it is. Like literally information about money in this industry has to be pried out like a dentist would extract a tooth. Anybody remember that uh, people weren't even talking about uh, sponsorships or ads or how much money they were making from that un until drama channels started reporting on it. If they could, brands would keep everything, everything hidden just so we don't know the extent of the profit that they're making off of us. Capitalism. There is a sort of touching moment where Jeffrey offers to take over Shane's merch. He says that he didn't want to offer before though the friendship was more solidified so Shane didn't feel taken advantage of because Jeffrey has been there and I don't deny he's been there because the beauty industry is full of clout chasers and Jeffrey does have a shitload of clout. He mentions that Shane could make more profit off his merch moment in which Shane goes is shocked by the fact that he's been ripped off and that he could have been able to make much more profit than he is currently. Um, he goes in the bathroom, cries a little bit about how it's the first time somebody's told him that he deserves better and comes back vowing to never let anyone trample over him again business-wise. Mm. I don't know if I should believe this is genuine or not. Like, I do believe that Shane was upset that he could have made more profit, but um, am I really supposed to feel sympathetic that, you know, a rich person could have been much more richer by now? I mean, I don't hate the rich. I don't hate people becoming rich by their own hard work and means or of merch or whatever, but it's uh, it's hard to be sympathetic that something like this would give him so much grief. And I speak more about it, I can see why it would be so upsetting. I would probably be just as upset in the situation, it's just very hard to empathize because he's literally making millions from that merch and he stands to make millions more. So I don't know, I think maybe uh, this is an emotional fault on my end because I can't empathize whereas he was feeling generally struck by the realization that he, um, he was being cheated out of some money. As the video goes forward, Jeffrey mentioned that he's not in it for the money, he's in it for the creativity and I 100% believe that. Jeffrey has since long branched out from just beauty. He, as far as I know, he's got investments, he's got other properties, he's um, got other business ventures. Like if he really wasn't into beauty and the makeup world, he would probably pull out two greener pastures. But as is, I do believe what he says about this being a creative outlet for him and that he puts thought into his releases. They continue on more to the creative side of things. They talk about possible shade names, they discuss possible shades, they swatch a couple of things. Shane is very, very excited about it. They mention maybe a pig backpack, a pig mirror. What is it with Shane and pig stills? Like, what's the, what's the deal? I'm not, don't really follow Shane. What's, can somebody fill me in? Like, what's with him and pigs? As the palette starts to get a bit of an idea of what it should be looking at Pantone catalogs. 
you know, this episode closes and we go and wait a week for the next one. The third part was called The Dangerous World of Jeffree Star, which honestly, I don't think it delivered on that bombastic title. The episode starts with Shane and his friends drinking uh, during the time where there was his call whole controversy with whether he fucked his cat or not, which uh, I honestly feel that post 2012, we fell into a dark dimension because I can't even believe some of the shit that I have to say this year. They start drinking and they say, oh, this palette isn't even out yet and they're trying to cancel me. A very interesting point that he made is that he wishes he were more like Jeffrey. Now their friendship, you know, as much as I dislike Jeffrey as a person, as much as I think Shane is also a um, problematic personage, I do feel that their friendship is pretty wholesome, they support each other, they talk about stuff. He says that he wants to learn to be more like Jeffrey because every time Shane gets into a controversy, he apologizes, whereas Jeffrey owns it and capitalizes upon it. Mm, I am not sure if that is a sound strategy because Jeffrey has the power and PR to remain unscathed without properly apologizing and also the psychological manipulation and the army of stands that are savvy enough to his bullshit to be able to protect him. I'm not sure Shane and his team are up to par yet with that. I do feel that Shane apologizing and owning up to his mistakes is more genuine and more endearing than just being like, yes, honey, you're just giving me the views. The editing in this episode was particularly interesting because it was a mix of high and lows. I don't like the camera work. The person who is handling the camera is a shitty cameraman, and I said it. There are the highs and the lows interspersed, so the good times that they went through designing Shane's palette, and then the lows. Shane's drama, Shane um, feeling insecure, Jeffrey getting his product stolen. At a certain point, Jeffrey points out that it's quite interesting that both of those are happening at the same time and at the moment I didn't quite realize how close together on the timeline, on this dark, dark timeline that we're in, both of those were. So there may be some merit to his speculation that it might be an inside job. Now I'm not yet imagining some anonymous beauty guru trying to bring the downfall of the house of Jeffree Star through subterfuge, intrigue, dark magic, and like the James Bond theme playing in the background, but it does have some merit. Industry sabotage is nothing new, so why would it be something new in the beauty world? Why would it not happen? There is no conclusive proof, but Jeffrey did mention that the theft in his warehouse of the concealers, it happened under suspicious circumstances. So you've got to imagine this, you've got the Mission Impossible theme playing in the background. A whole squad of thieves goes on your roof, drills a hole in your wall, slips through the wall, ceiling, whatever, steals a crate full of unreleased product, and your palette, and also fucking Red Bull cans for some reason. So to me, it is clear that this is quite personal and targeted, or the thieves were just feeling thirsty. He mentioned that they snuck in into the security room, fucked up the cameras, fucked up the footage, and they don't have backups, which as an IT person, I gotta judge. You gotta back up fucking everything. Even you, yes, you. Those photos you took of your vacation in whatever place last year, back them up. If your hard drive fries, those will be gone forever, just like your memories. And it seems that this was the overall drama that this episode wanted to capitalize on. I'm not gonna lie. I was hoping it would be about drama Gaden, but maybe in the next parts. I'm, I'm a terrible gossip. That's the only reason I'm watching this series, because I'm a terrible gossip. They start designing their palette. 
and uh, I think this was the most interesting part of the process for me. So this started in part two with choosing shade names, um, choosing some of the shades, looking at formulas, at samples, looking at the Pantone book. That was very fascinating to me to see the process start to finish. But it begs the question, what are these other influencers doing that they're spending like three years on a palette? Like, what the fuck are you designing? What are you even doing? Like, wh what are you spending so much of your time on? Like, wh what's, what's the spiel? Because at this point, I do feel that most influencers drag it on just for indecisiveness. And like, why can't other influencers be as efficient in coming out with a collab? Why does it take years as if they're like literally gestating that palette? Overall, the palette came together amidst the talk of drama, of Shane who did or did not fuck his cat of the Jeffree Star warehouse theft. Overall, I like, I like the color story. Like, I'm never going to buy it, but I, I do like the color story. Some of the shade names, though, did not age well. Patricia. <coughs> What's very interesting was Shane discussing what he wants for the palette, like the packaging. He was on fire. He was so creative there. I really have to give him props for that. Like the way he thought about, oh, we'll have a black and white spiral because I use that often in my videos. I don't want the triangle because I don't like holding triangles in my hand. I want an old TV set type of packaging because that reminds me of conspiracy theories and it's a motif we often use. They talk about the models that they want engraved on the shades itself. I really did enjoy this part of the creative process where they discussed, I want this to look like that and here is my reasoning. It really felt well thought of. It did not feel like a mindless collaboration. I mean, yes, he may be in it for the money, but at least he's putting some effort, unlike some other influencers that come out with collaborations. <laughs> Chocolate Hill! <laughs> Overall, I think that the palette collection is coming along really nicely. You know, every time I drag Jeffree Star, I always drag him for his personality and for the shit he does. But I cannot deny that the quality of his products and his designs are inspiring and innovating and something new. So, props to the devil for that. <laughs> So as they go with this whole back and forth, it segues finally into the happier moments of their lives and how they can't let the drama outshine these happy moments and let it ruin them. Uh, recently, Jeffrey's dogs died, so two of them I feel, which as a pet owner, I cannot imagine the pain. I would be devastated. I think it's a happy thing that Shane was able to get footage of all of the dogs together and it will be a nice memory that Jeffrey and Nate can look on in the future. There's also a footage of Shane and um, his partner's engagement and Shane's proposal and again I think this was a really nice touch because it really humanized both of them. It, it also kind of reminds you, you know, they're people with their faults and everything and no matter if I dislike them or not, if you dislike them or not, the drama and everything, life has to move on and they have to try and live their life and pursue their happiness in the way that they think they know best, just, just like the rest of us. I do feel that this series is one of the best things that could happen for their PR and for their public image. I am empathetic to some of the things there and I can relate to some of the other things there and I will give props or props are due but let's never forget that this whole video series is a calculated PR and marketing move. It is like tr they're trying to wash out their sins, they're trying to present themselves in a more human way whereas stands will love them even more and not fans will at least warm up a bit to them and it's working like I have to remind myself continuously while watching this series that both of these men have done shitty things in the past Shane less than Jeffrey but still both of them have done shitty things in the past and I don't support them but they do present a narrative where they are very likable I think overall my advice to you during this series is Keep in the forefront of your mind 
all of this shit that they've done particularly Jeffrey who is a repeat offender and just keeps doing the same shit over and over again keep in mind how they how Jeffrey has hurt people how he's attacked people how he's manipulated everybody around him how he's been involved in numerous dramas what we need to remember is that people are not 2d caricatures of themselves Jeffrey can be a good person to his friends he can be a great and loving partner, he can be a great and loving pet owner, and still have heinous, serious faults. He can be a good person in some areas of his life, and that is fair, but he also did some shit, and will probably continue to do some shit. And I feel that it is also a great advice for real life as well, just to remember that people are three-dimensional, complex beings, and that one negative thing does not deny the positive one, but neither do the positive things deny the negative ones, if that makes sense. I'm really excited to see the fourth part. I really want to see what more they come up with. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I know I've been late with these videos, but unfortunately I am oppressed by the fact that I have to work for a living. So, yeah, I don't get to film necessarily whenever I want. <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful evening, morning, second breakfast, whatever it is where you're from. Bye!